The difference in flavor between cow, sheep, and goat can really depend on the cheese type and sometimes you can't even notice it. Well, the best way I like to store cheese is first wrapping it in wax paper, taking it out of the plastic wrap that it's come to you in, unless it's perforated plastic or special cheese paper. Um, wax paper allows the cheese to breathe. The cheese is a whole colony of microorganisms and they need air. Uh, and once they stop getting air, then that allows for uh, spoilage to happen. So you want to wrap it in wax paper and then I like to either put it in a plastic bag or a Tupperware container and loosely close it, not all the way, um, and then stick all of that in the vegetable drawer of your refrigerator. That allows for the cheese to continue to get air, just enough moisture, keep checking it every day or every couple of days to see if it looks like it's drying out. If it's drying out, then close that bag a little bit more, the container. If it looks like it's a little too, too wet or oily in there, just open it up a little, let it breathe, and then uh, you can keep your cheese for possibly a couple weeks. Can you eat the rind of a cheese? This is a question I get all the time. Um, and really, you can eat most rinds of the cheese. The cheese is made up of two parts. There's the paste, which is the inside of the cheese, and then the rind, which is the outside of the cheese. They're all a part of the cheese. Um, it's really a matter of personal preference on whether or not you want to eat the rind because sometimes uh, the rind imparts different flavors. Like sometimes it's a little more mushroomy or earthy. Um, and that's, and that's really up to you. Uh, the only time I would say don't eat the rind is if it is covered in fabric or wax, something like that. Otherwise, go for it. Shopping for cheese can be one of the most daunting experiences for most people. Um, I see this all the time when I'm at the shop uh, and for a lot of customers there, it's their first time ever in a cheese shop and they're overwhelmed with the hundreds of choices they have before them. So, if you're in a situation like that and there is a responsible, knowledgeable cheesemonger behind the counter, trust the monger. Um, if you're by yourself though or want to just try out things on your own, just use your senses. That is the best gauge uh, for, for, for telling whether or not you'll like a piece of cheese. Um, to see if a cheese is uh, in proper shape, you can check out the color, make sure there's no discoloration of the rind or the paste, see if it looks like it's been sweating for a long time in that piece of plastic that it's wrapped in, meaning if it's been um, exuding oil, that's, that's sometimes the sign that it's been wrapped in there too long and it's not getting the air it needs to breathe, which can impart off flavors in the end. If it also looks like it's been, it's been wrapped for a long time in plastic, the, the plastic will kind of, you can sort of taste it in the cheese. Um, sniff it, see if it smells good. Uh, there are some stinky cheeses out there, but, but uh, really off cheese will smell like ammonia. You know that's past its prime. Um, or if it smells like, like it's been um, molding, but in a bad way, like if it's been wet or something like that, it's, it'll have a horrible smell. Um, just use your senses. And then if you really have a question, ask your cheesemonger. They'll be able to help you out, um, figure out if you want a hard or soft cheese or strong or mild. Um, the cheesemonger also knows what's, what's tasting really awesome that day. So just ask them. Um, well, knowing when a cheese is ready to eat also depends on what kind of cheese it is. If you're dealing with soft cheeses like the Brie style cheeses, Camembert, I like to just press them a little bit. If they give, then they're probably ready. Um, if they're a little springy and they just bounce right back, they're a little bit young. And uh, apart from that, I like to take a look at the rind. If it looks all completely white and clean. It's probably also a younger cheese. Older cheeses will have a little bit of, of brown or some, some marking on the rind, kind of like looks like it's getting older. Um, if it's a hard cheese, it really depends. Um, you can take a peek again at the paste and the rind, especially the paste. Younger cheeses tend to have a sort of chalky quality when you look at them, whereas older cheeses will just kind of, they'll look a little bit more settled. Um, but again, if you ask a cheesemonger, they'll know. They'll know what's ready to eat that day. <laughs> so to avoid getting an overripe cheese, again, just use your senses, uh, especially smell. Smell will tell you so much. If it smells like ammonia, it is probably past its prime. 
Um, some people actually really like that though, so you know, if you love really old cheeses, that's fine. Um, look, look for, well, look for on the paste if there are uh, bacteria or molds growing that are a little off-colored. It's normal to see blue molds growing with time on cheeses, um, especially hard cheeses. You can just scrape those off, but if it's really, really in there, you probably don't want that piece of cheese. Um, soft cheeses, if they're starting to get fuzzy blue mold, again, a little bit, that's all right, but if it's covered in it, uh, it won't harm you, but it probably means that cheese has been neglected a little bit too long. So, the difference in flavor between cow, sheep, and goat can really depend on the cheese type, and sometimes you can't even notice it, depending on the style. Uh, but generally, goat's milk cheese is very pronounced. Um, they tend to have a, a sort of citrus or lemony tang to them uh, if they're done properly, and they won't, they won't be necessarily animal smelling, like barnyard smelling, but they'll have a very clean, uh, bright citrus flavor. Sheep's milk cheeses, because they have a higher butter fat content than cow's milk cheeses, will just have a very rich flavor. It tends to be nutty, um, what I call woolly. You can, if, if you've ever been near a sheep, you're kind of, you're gonna understand what this means. It smells like a sheep. Um, but they tend to have a very deep, uh, sort of like deep in the back of your, your throat, sort of coating flavor. Uh, and cow's milk tends to have a more buttery flavor. We, just kind of, um, we've gotten so accustomed to cow's milk cheese because it's so prevalent on the market. But um, it'll, it'll, you can, well, it's difficult because you can make cow's milk taste like anything. There's Gouda, where the, the milk, whether it's sheep, goat, or cow, will taste almost like caramel. Um, there are alpine style cheeses made primarily from cow's milk that offer very nutty, nutty flavors and, and sort of sweet grass and hay aromas. Um, it really depends on what you like, but uh, they can all offer a wide array, array of flavors, actually. Serving cheese, you can do it almost as many ways as you can imagine. <laughs> I like to serve it really simply because I'm kind of a purist. Um, just having cheese and crackers uh, and maybe some fruit to kind of go along with everything works well for me. But if you really want to get creative, you can pair cheese with beer, you can try it with sake, you can try it with tea. Um, there are so many jams out there that create really beautiful flavor combinations with um, cured meats, olives, um, just, just be creative. There, there are so many things you can do with cheese. So serving cheese can really be as complex or as simple as you'd like. I like to have a couple of different knives on hand. One is an open-faced knife, so it's, it's the knife that you've seen that has little holes through the blade. Um, this I use primarily on soft cheeses. This, the, the holes in the blade will prevent the paste of the cheese from sticking to the knife and then ruining it. So that, that's a great one to have for camembert or brie or anything that is really soft and runny. Um, next, I love my chef's knife. I use it all the time for most other cheeses. So semi-hard cheeses, think maybe like Abbey de Belloc, which is um, a semi-hard sheep's milk cheese from France. Uh, that cuts really nicely with, with, a, knife, with a sharpened chef's knife. Uh, you can use the chef's knife too to like make little rustic uh, nuggets when you break off chunks of hard cheese. Um, these are really the only two I need in my home kitchen to serve up a cheese plate. In the cheese shop, when we're handling enormous wheels of cheese, like like 30 pound wheels of Gouda like this, or, or a Parmesan wheel that's 85 pounds, we have different knives. Uh, one is a double handled knife. It's probably about as wide as your body, and there are two handles on top. It can be curved on the bottom or flat, and this allows you to attack the cheese from above and use your body weight or a little bit of rocking motion to open to split open a, a large wheel of cheese. Parmesan knives are a little bit different. Um, they're small and they're made especially, I guess, to, I don't want to say stab, but it's kind of like stabbing the cheese. Um, what you're doing with a Parmesan knife is, um, is, 
is allowing the cheese to break open along its own natural fissures. So you're, you're, you're poking, the, you're stabbing the cheese, and it um, it will break naturally along along the lines that are that are of weakness, the, the lines of weakness that are already inside the cheese, and that way you coax it open as opposed to cutting it open. Um, and then there's the cheese wire, which you can have at home, or you can have it in the shop. We use it a lot in the shop to cut um, little delicate cheeses like Humboldt Fog, which is a classic goat's milk cheese that's easy to cut on the wire. It's, it's essentially a platform and then uh, there's, a, there's a line down the center of the platform that you pull a wire through to slice the cheese that way. Um, and with that, there's no need for a lot of force. The wire just cuts through cheese wonderfully and it creates a really beautiful clean break. Um, that's an essential tool for a cheesemonger and if you're cutting a lot of cheese at home um, you probably want to get one of those. It's a lot of fun. Uh, there's another way of cutting cheese. It's more of a, it's a, more of a serving method. Um, there's sort of a spindle. You put the cheese on and then you can shave off the top uh, in circles. You, there's a little handle that you can, you can I'm not sure how to describe this. You just kind of like create round shavings from the top of the of the cheese. Uh, that is, that's a, a beautiful way to make florets of cheese, but um, it doesn't work for everything. <laughs> so it, you don't see it that often. So I brought four cheeses to share with you today. Two of them are actually from the same California cheesemaker, but the first one is from Oregon. It's called Freya's Wheel. It's made by Briar Rose Creamery, which is composed of a husband and wife team. Um, they started their cheesemaking process rather late in life. For a lot of people, cheesemaking is a second career, career or, or a post-retirement career. Um, but this husband and wife team, they had thought of starting their cheesemaking operation in California, but found that Oregon was much better suited to their needs, so they moved up there bought a creamery and uh, built it and started making cheeses like this Freya's Wheel. Um, in particular, this one is based on another English cheese called Ticklemore that the cheesemaker had learned when apprenticing in England, but she, she kind of fiddled with the recipe and, and modified it to her needs. Uh, this is almost like two cheeses in one because along the rind, you'll see a soft, creamy layer of cheese. It's a little bit darker than the center, which is gonna be a little bit chalkier and fudgy in texture. Um, this one is beautiful. It's got notes of mushroom and toasted nuts, hazelnuts, and a beautiful texture, especially along the rinds. That creamy part is so delicious. The second cheese comes from Bleating Heart Creamery, which is up here in Northern California, also um, from a husband and wife team. And they also started cheese making as a second career after working desk jobs in research laboratories. Uh, they focus primarily on sheep's milk cheese. And this one called Fat Bottom Girl was an accident. Um, Shauna, the cheese maker, she, she was um, setting the cheeses out to age and instead of flipping them regularly like she should have, she forgot to flip them once or a couple of times. And so all of the solids in the milk sank down to the bottom of the cheese, making it kind of shaped like a, almost like a bell. Um, instead of calling that a failure, she just decided to roll with it, and now it's their signature cheese. Um, this cheese is beautiful because it tastes almost exactly like the farm that it came from. You can taste the grass in the rind especially. You can taste the cellar that it's, the cheese is aged in. You can taste the nuttiness and the paste and the rich, rich um, woolly quality in the milk. It's, it's a beautiful cheese that shows off the California landscape very well. The third cheese is from Vermont. And this is a bit of a happy surprise um, when customers come into the shop to find it because it's made by descendants of the Von Trapp family the, from Sound of Music. Um, and it's, um, again, this is a second career for the cheesemakers. They are two brothers, um, Sebastian and Dan. 
They started making this cheese. Um, I, they, they had gone into so many other business ventures as a family before. Cheese was just next on the list, it seems. So it's a washed rind cheese, which is um, a style of cheese making that requires rubbing the cheese with um, salt water or brine solution as it ages, which gives it more flavor and a little bit more color. Um, it's a cheese made from raw Jersey milk. So Jersey milk is known for having a very, very rich flavor, buttery, buttery, um, buttery flavor, rich texture. Um, and it's, it just tastes like a beef stew or a meat stew along with butter. <laughs> butter and beef stew. Um, and the last cheese, is again from Bleating Heart Farm. I wanted to showcase California cheeses since we're in California. This is a cow's milk cheese called Moolicious. It's based on Bleating Heart's sheep's milk version of this cheese called Bulicious. Um, it's a blue cheese. Again, it tastes very much like the farm. It's very earthy, fairly mild, but also very buttery. And it's, it just makes for a nice introductory blue cheese, especially um, for people who, who say they don't really love strong cheeses. So it's a good segue into the blue world. If anyone wants to learn more about cheese pairings or the cheeses that I work with or the farms that I visited, um, you can visit my blog at misscheesemonger.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at misscheesemonger or Twitter at MSS Cheesemonger, or you can email me at vero, V-E-R-O, at misscheesemonger.com. See if a cheese is uh, in proper shape. You can check out the color, make sure there's no discoloration of the rind or the paste. See if it looks like it's been sweating for a long time in that piece of plastic that it's wrapped in, meaning if it's been um, exuding oil, that's, that's sometimes a sign that it's been wrapped in there too long.